So first, a short introduction. So I just did a master at UCLA, so a master on quantum computing, basically, called the Master of Quantum Science and Technologies. Then this summer, I was working at the United States Air Force Research Lab, uh, doing research on just photonics, computing, and this kind of stuff, exactly the real speeder that we're talking about. And now I'm working at Spectral, which is a startup that is a, a spin-off from the CQT. The first thing I have to say is I'm here tonight in my own name, Felix. I'm giving the talk um, not on behalf of Spectral, so everything that I'm saying is just my thoughts and what I've been doing so far. I'm not here as a, 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 on, on my work time, and I'm not here representing the company in any way. Also, I just started the job, so anyway. Um, I want to give you some motivation on quantum communication. So just so you can realize also what happened, we just showed you the Shaw algorithm that is pretty famous that can manage to you know, um, decompose uh, prime numbers in, in very quickly, which is a big threat to the current system of cryptography. And this is why it's motivating new way of doing encryption. So you have the post-quantum cryptography or you have the quantum key distribution that we also mentioned. So we need to protect everything. And we actually need to protect it now. Why? Because even if a quantum computer arrives in 20 years, what can happen is someone listening to our current communication right now, the communications are encrypted, store the information. We cannot decrypt it, but we're storing them. And then we will use in 20 years a quantum computer to break the current information. So in 20 years, someone can find out all the secrets that we were sharing today. So even if the quantum computer doesn't exist yet, the threat is acting on us today. That's why you have this motivation right now to boost the field of secure communication, either with post-quantum cryptography or uh, secure quantum communication, to secure today's data from the threat of future computers. I hope you are motivated to do quantum communication now. All right, uh, so you've worked a lot tonight. Um, I'll try to be short. Uh, my point tonight is I want to show you uh, things that are real, so I want you to believe me. So if I want you to believe me, I want you to demonstrate that what we're doing is actually working. So I want to introduce you the BB84 protocol. Um, I'll try to do this very quickly. Um, you know a photon, a light can be a wave, so it's an undulation. So you have the direction of propagation of light, but you also have the direction of the oscillation of light. Light can oscillate like vertically. You can need to watch my hand, guys. You're watching the wrong thing. Watch my hand. I'm doing it again. So light can oscillate and then propagate in this direction, but it can also oscillate this way to propagate in the same direction. The direction of the oscillation is not the direction of the propagation. The direction of the oscillation of the wave is called the polarization of light. So we can encode information in the polarization of light. This is what we're doing. So we have Alice and Bob. You know Alice and Bob very well now. We've been speaking about them for quite some time. And we set some photons um, that are encoded in different um, directions. So you have vertical photons, horizontal photons, diagonal photons, and anti-diagonal photons. And then they can be detected by Bob. So I need to give you the rule. The rule is when Bob is, de is detecting a photon in a base, if he's detecting vertical and horizontal photon in the vertical and horizontal base, he gets vertical or horizontal photon. Nice. If he's measuring diagonal and anti-diagonal in the diagonal and anti-diagonal base, he's measuring the right hand side. However, what happens if I'm measuring a diagonal photon in a vertical and horizontal base? Can you guess? So the answer is it's quantum mechanics and will have a probabilistic outcome. One time out of two will get the horizontal, one time out of two will get the vertical. It's the same if I measure a vertical photon in a diagonal base, it's probabilistic. I will have an answer, I will always have an answer, but a mixed one. So we're going to use this rule to make a communication protocol. So here's the protocol. Um, Alice just randomly sends vertical, diagonal, anti-diagonal, horizontal photons to Bob. Bob merges them randomly in one or the other basis. So 50% of the time, Bob is measuring in the right basis and is measuring the correct answer. 50% of the time he's measuring in the wrong basis and he's getting something weird. So they, Alice and Bob agree 50% of the time. So then they can, they can talk to each other publicly, like they can say out loud, everybody can listen, no worries. 
and uh, they can share the basis. Um, Alice knows what she's sending, Bob doesn't really know what he's receiving, but he knows in which basis he's measuring. So they will share the basis, and that's the second line. Then they can select the basis when they agree on, because Alice knows in which basis she sent each photo, and then select the 50% time when they agreed, and they manage to secure some communication. So this is what happens normally. So if they do this normally, they will find like half of the bits they are communicating will be good. So now we are in the real world, so maybe like one percent of the time there will be an issue, there's a cloud, or there's something going on, and one bit, bit flips. So you have like an error, so you have one person error. Maybe you have a very bad communication channel, so you have like 10 person error. That's fine, so 10 person of the time, you agree on the basis, but you get 10 person of error. Okay, fine. But now somebody is listening. It's called Eve. It's a new person in this process. Eve is listening. So Eve will measure something in the middle. We'll try to intercept the communication. If Eve intercepts the communication, she doesn't know which, in which basis the photons are coming. So she will try to guess as well. So she can guess right. She can be in the right basis 50% of the time. If she's in the right basis, she listens, OK, and she sends again. And we cannot notice because she's sending the same thing. Now, if she's in the wrong basis and she listens, she will receive something, she will send something new, and this something new, and we will receive it in our basis. There will be 50% of chance that it clicks to the right direction and 50% of the chance that it will click in the wrong direction. Maybe I can give you an example. I'm sending a vertical photon. Eve is measuring it in the wrong basis, in diagonal. She clicks on diagonal. She sends diagonal because she believes it's a diagonal photon. Now, I measure it in vertical basis. And the diagonal clicks on the vertical. So I cannot know that Eve listened because Bob is sending a, a vertical. I'm receiving a vertical. I didn't know someone was in the middle. But 50% of the time, when this diagonal photon is arriving, it used to be a vertical one. Now it's a, a diagonal one. Now I'm clicking horizontal. Oh, there is error. So Eve measures in the wrong basis 50% of the time. And when she measures in the wrong basis, she has 50% chance that we don't notice. So there is 25% chance that we notice that she listen. So when we compare our basis, if we see the error rates going above 25%, it means that someone is listening to us. And if someone is listening to us, we have lost the security of our quantum communication. This is quantum key distribution. It's a way to notice that someone is listening to us, and it relies on the fact that the measurement destroys the quantum state. I hope you have followed here so far. Thank you very much for this. This was, this was theory. I hope you believe me now. It's working very well. So we're going to see implementation. So everybody's trying to do quantum key distribution. It's simple. You send photon one by one. OK, you need a laser. You send photon, photon, photon with this protocol. And you send it to optical fiber. So I'm showing here actual real world implementation. I don't know if you're aware of this, but China is actually leading the race of quantum communication very well. And they have built all around China a huge connection of optical fiber, a huge network. It's called the quantum internet, when they can use quantum communication uh, protocol to, to talk to each other. The US is trying to catch up. Uh, you have a plan to do some experiments in Chicago on the top. You have, this is New York on the, on the right. Um, it's actually happening right now. Uh, the one in New York is running. So they're sending quantum states and doing quantum communication. And on the top, you have Washington. As you can see, these uh, test beds in the US are much smaller than the one in, in China. And in the middle, I'm showing you companies. IB is um, a Swiss company. Quantum is a company in Israel. Toshiba, you know, Toshiba is actually have a very important airport in UKD. And Kunex is a company in New York. It's happening right now. It's already happening now. It's an industry. And people sell this kind of quantum communication device to some clients, banks, or governments that want to protect data. So what is the issue? The issue is optical fiber have absorption. Very, very low one, but it's absorption still. On the left, you have a graph. The, um, the axis is the wavelength, and the vertical axis is the loss. So you can see that at some 15, um, 50 nanometer wavelengths, you have a very low absorbance. This is what we're using to do 
um, optical um, fiber communication. The absorption is uh, 0.16 dB per kilometer, so you lose 3.6 percent, 3.6 percent every kilometer, which is if you do it after one of the kilometer, you you are left with 2.5 percent of your original signal. If you do it for 200 kilometer, you're left with 0.06 percent of the original signal, which is fine when you want to just do classical communication because you can just send big amount of light and we can repeat it. You just, every 100 kilometer, you listen to it and you send a new signal again, which is more powerful. But as you know, in quantum communication and in quantum, measuring a state destroys it, so we cannot use quantum repeaters, so we have to maintain it. The other issue is we are not communicating with like thousands of photons, we are communicating one photon by one photon. And now you're sending one photon for 200 kilometer, you have 0.06% chance that the photon is arriving. That's really an issue. So the solution is actually very simple. If you want to do more than 200 kilometers, you have to go to space. And this is why we build space quantum satellites. So this is Pookie one It's a satellite that was built here in NUS. On the left, you see how you prepare the photons. It's actually very, very simple. Uh, you have a laser somewhere. You have some cubes. You see the cubes are like glass material. You have some um, optical components to direct the photons. And you produce the photon one by one. And you can do this. And then you can see what is the size of this satellite on the right. And you know what happened to this satellite? It went to space for some testing. Here it is. You have quantum physics in space with a laser. I don't know how cool is this, but it's pretty cool. The next step is to have a communication with the ground. So you have a laser shining this photon to the ground uh, when they pass by. On the right, you have a telescope trying to get these photons that you are sending. Once again, you're sending photons one by one. So you have to be able with your telescope to detect one photon coming one by one. So currently, it's working only at night time when you don't have moon. So it's not very often, and you need to be very close to the perpendicular axis to measure these photons. But it's still working. We can send some 10 kilobits uh, of uh, secure keys every time we pass. And this is the current field of the technology. And the, less, the next um, satellites to be launched will be this one. They're going to be launched very soon. They are much bigger, as you can see. And it's, um, it's a field of space quantum lasers. And finally, the next step, as you start to understand now, is to do entanglement distribution, so is to have, because quantum key distribution, as I showed you, didn't rely on entanglement yet. It's the one, the protocol that I showed you, to just rely on the fact that if there's a listener, we'll spot him because he will destroy the state. But what you can do is actually distribute entanglement and send one Alice somewhere, like in Singapore, one Alice in, in one Bob in Toronto, with a satellite passing over, and this will make entanglement communication possible on the planet since the next step. This is very exciting, and yes, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the ice cream. If you have any questions, I can answer one or two questions, and then I will have maybe a bonus. Does anyone has, have a question? Yes? Thank you for the talk. Um, just now you mentioned the downlink effect of laser from the satellite to the ground, right? Um, but you also mentioned it's for quantum key distribution, you send one photon at a time. Yeah. So I'm a bit confused, how does the one photon make it through the atmosphere and not be dissipated? Ha, it works. You send one photon at a time, uh, very quickly, okay? It's, there's a high frequency, but one photon by one photon. And it's not absorbed by the atmosphere, and it's like very unlikely to be absorbed by maybe 10% absorption from the atmosphere. There is some absorption, but not too much. So in order to really answer the question, we use another laser, which is very powerful at another wavelength, which is giving a clock signal that is being received. So we can match our clock on the satellite and on the ground to see if we missed a photon that got absorbed by the atmosphere or not. So we know when we lost the photon. Thank you. Thanks for your question. I think there's a question here. Or maybe on top there. Just sort of uh, 
um, secure quantum communication to try to emerge in a new market? So the way we say it, so I have a master in quantum technologies. Um, as you may know, it's the second quantum revolution. The first quantum revolution already happened uh, with um, uh, MR, in English you say MRI, uh, GPS and stuff. You need a lot of quantum effects to describe everything. Scanner as well. Second quantum revolution concerns three technologies. Quantum computing, we've seen this today, quantum communication, and actually quantum sensing. So we can use atoms to improve the sensibility of captors. Quantum sensing is already ready, it's working, and it's already commercialized, and it's already being put on warplanes, ships, submarines, it's already happening. Quantum communication is in the industrial phase, so companies are emerging, and it's being deployed, and quantum computing is kind of lagging behind. But it's kind of pushing all the others forward as well, because it's like the threat, you know. And also with quantum communication, don't you rely on any sort of um, infrastructure that has been set up, like, like the um, options, options of the main So, as I showed you today, you have two ways to do quantum communication. Either you use optical fiber, either you use satellites. You can also use drones, maybe. Okay, drones will go into the satellite uh, category. Optical fiber already exists everywhere on the planet. Okay. The networks already exist. So, uh, do you think, um, if you can look across like uh, where we are technologically, do you think um, there's market demand for this sort of secure quantum communication technology to improve? Yes, this is why uh, we have a job in our company. Uh, ID Quantic, the Swiss company, was founded um, in 2005. And I think in 2000, or maybe 2008, um, in 2010, 11, I don't know if you remember, you were young, the, all of you, there were something called the Edward Snowden Papers, when we realized that the NSA was listening to everybody on the planet. When we realized this, the business of ID Quantix selling secure quantum communication just exploded. Everybody wanted to buy some QKD emitters because we want to secure communication. So yes, it's already a business. It has been for 15 years. Thank you. To continue on this, uh, the beauty of QKD is it's secure with or without quantum computers. It's like it's secure for, uh, against everything. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned that the transmission to the satellite is an individual photon that you have to detect those individual photons yeah. in order to receive them. But how do you do this without collecting the state? Without classical state? Uh, with, without, without destroying the state, the quantum state. Oh, at, at, the, at the very end when we measure it, we destroy it. But uh, how do you detect the photons uh, for the satellite to receive them without like, interacting with them? So the how, oh, well, when we emit it, the emission or the reception? Are you talking on the satellite side or on the ground side? Uh, the satellite. Oh, okay. On the satellite, that's a very good question. On the satellite, we know what we're emitting. So we have a way to, without measuring it, knowing what we're producing. We deterministically know what we're producing and we know what we're producing. That's a very good question. If you measure what you're producing, then yeah, you're destroying what you're producing. So you need to find a way. I, I just, I was working on this today and it's very stupid. You just have four different sources. The uh, uh, vertical one, horizontal one, diagonal and diagonal, and you activate the one you want, when you want one or another. And the randomness is generated, uh, the, the RNG generation for what you understand. All right, thank you very much. I have a, s a small bonus of one minute. Um, actually, the re oh yeah, you have another question? Yeah, yeah, yeah let's go for it. Um, so if I understand correctly, um, so that there's light being transmitted in the one, one kind of vertical one direction, and then the other one has like a particular kind of time detecting it correctly. But after that, you have to share the key anyway. Yes. So why not share it to begin with? No, no, I'm so sorry. You don't share the key. You share the basis. Oh, and sorry, and yes, you share the key. So what we do is we share half of our keys. Okay. We agree, we say, okay, let's share 50% of what we have. Mm -hmm. And if on the 50% that we have, we, when we talk to each other, we see that it's secure, then we know that the other 50% should have been secure as well. Like nobody has listened to it. Oh, no, 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 I mean that if, 
think at the end of the day for the you know receiving party to understand the message, they need to be able to share with them which phrases they got correct, yes? Yes, you can do it publicly. Oh. You can do it publicly. Everybody can listen, we don't care. Oh, okay, so that's not a Yeah, we don't care. That's what I'm saying. But you, what if the person listening between can listen to that? Can it it doesn't them? matter because if the person that has been listening uh, is listening to us communicating publicly, we can still notice that he has listened. Oh. That's the beauty of our thing. We know that if someone is in the middle, we'll spot it. And we can communicate loudly and saying to everybody what has happened, and if we see that we could, we keep the other half for us. Thank you, thank you. Very good question. Okay. <laughs> good. But I think everybody, uh, if you have more questions, also you can come speak to me. Okay, very, yeah, maybe come speak to me so I can do my bonus. Yeah? To spoof, yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, yes, it's vulnerable to, to like, because it's one photon by one photon, you just shine a big laser to it and you're destroying the communication capabilities. So people are working around that, so the idea is to have very mobile platforms, like drones and everything. Okay, if you have